Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Mears. I'm a program manager for Libraries Connected. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be welcoming you all to this autism friendly webinar this morning. Um, we, we, Libraries Connected is a national charity working with public libraries in England, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Crown Dependencies. And we are really excited to be working with Dimensions UK, who are going to be running this webinar for us. We've been working with, alongside the ASCO, the Association of Senior Children Librarians, with Dimensions UK since 2016, or just before 2016, uh, where we started the partnership. Um, and we've continued that partnership since then. So six years we've been working with Dimensions UK, and, um, and we are thrilled to be kind of reviewing the partnership now and, and, and kicking off a new phase of work. So um, before, I, before I introduce the first speaker, just a little bit of housekeeping. We will be recording, as you'll have heard, the webinar for those not able to attend. And as this is a two hour webinar, we're going to be giving you a break sometime after 11, just so that you have a break from the screens. The first part of the webinar will be presented from colleagues from Dimensions UK and Sorrel Clements from Coventry Libraries. Um, and the final 30 minutes or so of, of the webinar will be a panel discussion, so a chance for you to ask any questions that you have as you hear the presentation. So please do put any questions in the chat. Um, if you could put a cue by them, that would be really helpful so we can identify them. And then we'll make sure we ask the panel at the end of the, at the, end of the presentations. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Sorrel Clements, who's a service development manager from Coventry Libraries. And Sorrel was one of the first uh, people and first library services to really get involved in autism friendly libraries. And uh, so Sorrel is going to give us a case study of her work this morning. Hi, everyone. My name is Sorrel from Coventry Libraries. It's absolutely amazing to be talking to you all today about this, this work and reflecting back on our journey since 2016. We were really lucky, very, very lucky that almost it was a perfect storm. Askell were doing some work, as Sarah said, with uh, at that time it was the Society of Chief Librarians and with Dimensions. And we, in Coventry, we thought this is a fantastic opportunity. We also, the City Council had a little bit of Autism Innovation Capital Grant that they um, had from the, the Department of Health and Social Care. So those things all came together and it just seemed such a great opportunity to do something to really make a difference for people. But if we go on to the next slide um, and, the ne and the next one. But we really, um, who, who are the experts really? We knew, I'm being honest, we knew absolutely nothing. We didn't, we knew we wanted to do something. But we thought, what can we do? How can we, how can we really make this valuable for people with autism, families that ha were, were living with autism? We started with no knowledge and no contact. So what we did, we went to, we thought, well, the local SEND team must have some contacts. And we went to them and spoke to them, sold them our idea and, and talked to them about libraries in 2016 and the kind of spaces that they are and the, ch the difference that we, you know, we weren't quiet places. We wanted to make a difference. And they put us in touch with a group of parents of children with autism. And that is where the magic happened. I would say to everybody that is your first starting point is to talk to people that are really living with autism. They were very, very vocal to us about their experience of using libraries, not only with the children with autism, but also the impact because they didn't go to libraries very often, the impact that it then had on other children in the family and that they were missing out. So. We worked with them, a, a smaller group. They started to come and have their, their kind of adult support group in our library space, got to know it, got to know the staff. Then we created a questionnaire with that group of families and shared it far wider. We went to a local autism conference and they shared it as well through all their contacts. 
um, so that we we could gather together and find out really what what people wanted. I think what I learned through this, unlike some of the other projects that I've done, is I had to really we had to kind of pace ourselves, and we were like really eager and wanting to get ahead and wanting to do something. But to make it really work, it takes time to do that proper evaluate, you know, questionnaires and evaluation. And it takes time to talk to people, particularly people who may not see libraries as a welcoming space. Next slide, please. So the next thing we did, listening to all the feedback, uh, looking at the, the results of the questionnaire, we started to make some changes. And we made some really, what, what really are very small changes, but they had a huge benefit, not just to families and people with autism, but to the wider community, as I know many of you on, on this call, you'll all appreciate that. So we did things like we created a, a map and a plan of, of the library. We piloted it in one library to kind of, so we could test everything out. That library's called Tile Hill. We created a map and a plan that was colour coded. We replaced all the signage to match the colour codedness of the library. And you can see we, we put it up in the library. We also had kind of giveaways of that. We did things like having photographs of the staff on display as a, as a welcome and again as a clarity about who people were going to see in that library space. And we created a video that people can watch from home before they come to the library. The video was particularly made to, to explain that journey through the building and, and what people would experience. We, the staff used the dim dimensions training video so that they all had an awareness. And we created a special autism friendly hour. So the, the families would come together in that hour and use the libraries. So next slide, please. So the, the funding that we had, we used just to, really, it wasn't a lot of money. We just bought some laptops and put some software on those. We bought some bean bags, some wobble cushions, and a sensory tent so that people could have a, a little bit of quiet time if that's what they wanted. And that's still in the library, it's still being used today. So a lot of the things that I've talked about so far are things that came from the families. From the library's point of view, it was about how we looked at the stock and resources that we have and how we use the, the knowledge, the knowledge that we all have working in libraries. We heard from families that their children preferred to have a book with a CD alongside it. So we invested in lots of those. We bought specialist collections, either to help parents with autism, books that had people with autism and, and other neurodiverse conditions at the center of the story, books written by authors. We just tried to pull everything in and made sure that those collections were really highlighted. We um, moved them around the library if, if the um, autism session was on so that they were easy to access. And as you can see there, again, many of you will be familiar with those. The high-low books from Barrington Stoke were absolutely fantastic. And the families hadn't heard of those before and thought they were really, really useful. So again, it, it's so important to things that we take for granted as librarians and that we know about, uh, there's, a, there's always, people who, who don't know about them. So it was really important to, to try and share that. Next slide, please. So our success, um, we were so excited that families came. Um, there are pictures of rooms full of children. The families run the sessions themselves. We provide a few craft bits and a few bits and pieces. We keep a constant dialogue with them to try and support them. But the, the, all, all the library service did really was facilitate the space on the autism friendly hour. 
We also did a lot of talking to the other users of the library to make sure they appreciated what was going on and that they appreciated um, what we were doing. Um, and they knew that it was something that was very important to us. So if they didn't want to uh, be part of it, we suggested they came back at a different time. Very, but we were very strong about it. Because we started in 2016, the original families and children that we work with um, have moved on. And we've just had this wonderful thread throughout where some families have left and new families have been encouraged to join. Like, like with any group of people, there's been the odd kind of falling out. And at some points, um, I think we did go through a little period where there was nobody coming to the sessions. But then slowly by keeping it going, by keeping the messages going, by keeping the contacts, they, people, different people started coming back and we've started all over again. And again, that's something that I think you have to be ready for because it's so based around local people. Um, next slide, please. And, and it's just the amazing interest that has been, I've had visitors from Korea, Sweden, America, lots of people have come to hear about the approach that we've taken. And there's been a lot of interest in how we did it in a public library, in a public library setting, whilst we were open to everybody. And what I, why I've put this as my last slide is that that interest, you know, it's a global interest. Librarians across the world really want to make a change and make a difference. And, and I thought that was a great place to kind of move on to the next speaker. Thanks so much for that, Sorrel. I thought we'd start the presentation by hearing from a real life example to hopefully help you understand that this is possible and it's not as daunting as it might seem. So I'm going to kick off by talking about autism. So when we ran our original survey for this, we found out that 40% of autistic people never visited their library. And considering it's estimated that one in 100 people across the country have autism, that's a lot of people that are missing out on the opportunity to go to their local library. Autism itself is a lifelong developmental condition and it affects how a person senses the world. Too much sensory input can be really overwhelming, but it can also affect how people communicate. It's also no worth knowing that everybody experiences autism differently. And there's a famous saying of once you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. So what is sensory overload? Autistic people can find it really difficult to suppress background input um, and to be able to focus on making decisions or even in listening to what's being said to them. Um, this analogy, which was sent to me by Michelle, who's here today, says, imagine trying to do long division in your head at a music concert. So too much input can cause sensory overload. It's why routine, reducing that, that sensory input and clear instructions and choices can really help customers who have got autism. And just to show the effect of that, 90% of autistic people we asked said they would visit the library if autism friendly changes were made for them. So sensory overload can cause something called a meltdown. This is where the person can react in a very erratic way or in a more discreet way. So they might thrash around on the floor, they might cry, they might shout, they might start tapping or hitting themselves or rocking back and forth. It's a way of them processing what's going on and just grounding themselves a little bit. So if you do see somebody having a meltdown, clear the area of any potential hazards, try to make the environment less stimulating, ask people to move away so they've got as much privacy as possible. And if there's somebody with them, ask if there's anything you can do to help or wait for it to pass and then ask if there's anything that you can do to help. Sensory overload doesn't just cause the meltdown though, it can cause shutdowns. Now this is when the person basically just shuts themselves off. They close all their senses off. They might not move, speak or respond when engaged with. They might get selective mutism so they can't respond to what you're saying. They might not look at you. This isn't somebody being rude. This is just another way of processing all those tabs that are open in their brain at that particular time.
If you do see someone who's going through this shutdown, just give them space and quiet and make sure someone's around to help them when they've come out of it. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Logan. Logan has been working with Dimensions for years now and helped develop this training with us. He has autism himself. Um, and yeah, take the stage, Logan. Hello, I'm Logan and I'm autistic. Um, I love art and hand-drawn animation. Um, I am an animator. Um, I studied filmmaking in college and um, I like reading books about the art of filmmaking, but I also like manga as well. Um, I have sensory processing disorder, so I can experience sensory input um, far greater than others, or in some cases, not as much as others. <laughs> um, for example, sounds are louder, uh, smells can be stronger, uh, lights can be brighter, and it makes going to public spaces incredibly difficult. Um, I tend to shut down um, after coming home from going out in public spaces because just all of that input in one day um, it, it does take a lot of energy out of you. Um, I have selective mutism, which means sometimes I can't always communicate verbally. So sometimes I'll have to use text-to-speech to communicate instead. Um, my siblings are also autistic, but you know, as everyone with autism, they experience it differently. As Sarah mentioned earlier, you've, if, when you've met one autistic person, you have met one autistic person. So while I may speak from experience, I most certainly don't speak for everyone on the autistic spectrum. So um, some of my tips for um, autism friendly libraries. Um, one big thing is not to expect eye contact. Um, I had a lot of issues with this in my drama class. I would get told off for not making eye contact. And, you know, it's just one of those things. I, I can't help it. It's like trying to um, ask someone in a wheelchair to walk up the stairs. You know, it's just, it's just not going to happen. So, um, so don't exactly expect someone to make direct eye contact. They are most likely still listening to you. Um, some people can find it hard to make eye contact and to concentrate at the same time. Um, so don't assume that silence is because of lack of understanding. Uh, some people might find it difficult to talk. Some people might just be processing what you said. Um, and others can talk quite a lot about topics when they're interested about it as well. Um, so autistic people tend to find it difficult to block out background noise, so like lights and colours um, to focus on. Um, it's another reason why um, eye contact is often avoided, because if they're looking at you, they're focusing on you and not what you're saying necessarily. Um, so what you could also do is help limit the options. So um, instead of saying, what sort of books would you like, say, shall I show you where the nonfiction books are? Shall I show you where the horror books are, etc. It just helps reduce that amount of things they need to think about. They've already got loads of tabs open on their browser and you're just closing down some of those tabs and narrowing the options down. So um, uh, try not to make promises that you can't keep. So um, you may say that a book will become available when the other person has is due to bring it back, but you know some sometimes things go wrong and you know the person brings it back late and then they'll come back and say, well, you said it would be available on this day, so why isn't it? you know, like plan for the unexpected essentially. So, um, cause some, some autistic people can be very specific and it can stress them out if things don't go according to plan. So don't make a guarantee that something will go according to plan if you know it, then it might not. Um, so don't rely on words, you know, as, as in my case, I'm, I'm selective mutism, I'm have selective mutism. So, um, sometimes words don't, don't work for me. So, um, you know, um, I mentioned earlier that I use text to speak to text to speech to communicate sometimes, um, but some people also use Makaton, which is a simplified version of sign language. Um, now that might sound intimidating, but you don't have to be fluent or anything. If you just learn some of the basic signs, for example, different genres, different book types, maybe even different emotions, and um, also that can help with eye contact as well, because now they're looking at your hands and um, focusing on what, you're what point you're trying to get across. So avoid jargon, slang and metaphors. You know, don't say stuff like it's raining cats and dogs. Then you might be like, wait, really? <laughs> you know, um, uh, also sort of give them that um, independence, you know, as, as every um, person sort of wants, especially um, older people. Um, so I find it often intimidating when I've just gotten into somewhere 
and a staff member instantly comes up to me asking what I'd want I'm like well I haven't even looked around yet you know I, I don't know what I want I'm still processing every everything around me um I can find that intimidating um you know some some per some people might go in and, and hope please no one talk to me I don't have the confidence to respond but on the other hand you might get people who come in and be like please I really hope someone talks to me because I don't have the confidence to go up and ask them myself um but it's it's often often you can tell when someone sort of wants to be alone and you know sort of just respect their privacy and um sort of leave, leave them to it if that's what they want and if they don't want that then uh, see what you can do to help um some autistic people don't like being touched um it can cause stress and anxiety as it would for most people um but some people might find it hard to understand personal space you know they might want to come up and give you a hug or take your hand and if you don't want them uh, simply just tell them and they should understand thanks very much logan um you did really well there you were fantastic i'm going to move on to making your library autism friendly now. And when we say autism friendly, what we really mean is sensory friendly. So because libraries are generally considered quiet places, it can deter some autistic people from going. They're afraid of disturbing the peace. And quite often people have a very old fashioned view of their school library where the strict librarian was constantly shushing them and telling them off for moving around and making noise. It's also worth knowing that while some people with autism need a quiet environment, they make noise themselves. So they might talk to themselves or other people. They might get easily excitable and they might move around. You might see autistic guests getting excited, engrossed in what they're reading. That's really positive and it should be encouraged. Um, but also bear in mind that some autistic people like background noise, so not every autistic person likes it to be dead quiet. I know Logan likes some ambient noise in the background, and I certainly do as well. So we aren't looking to create one overall atmosphere. We're looking to create pockets of different atmospheres, for example. So a quiet corner in your library where you know there's not much traffic and then a louder corner in the library, perhaps where the children's section is and being able to advise people where those sections are and direct them to them and let them know that they're welcome in all of them and they don't have to stay in one place is really positive. It should be clear to other customers that your library is autism friendly and that includes tolerance of certain levels of noise and acceptance of different behaviours. Your staff team should certainly see this as an opportunity to raise public understanding about autism and encourage them to explain to other customers what being autism friendly means. And by hosting special events, you can also raise that understanding and awareness. So reducing sensory stimulation. As everyone who's autistic experiences things differently. Some people might be hypersensitive to sound, whereas others might be hypersensitive to silence. Some people might have selective mutism and someone else might be particularly talkative. I'm sure Chelsea won't mind me saying that she's a very talkative colleague of ours, whereas Logan experiences selective mutism himself. So you've got the best of both worlds in this meeting. So what was that, Sarah? <laughs> Nothing, Chelsea. <laughs> At times, libraries can also be bright, loud and exciting places with children and groups enjoying the public space. For many people, the main cause of sensory overload is that noise, movement, lights, colours and generally a change in the atmosphere that's unexpected. And because social interaction can also increase stress, times where there's lots of people around and the feeling of having to conform, so to speak, to societal rules can really cause stress. But you know your library best. Think about how you can create a sensory friendly environment and a consistent atmosphere. This includes reducing or increasing lighting to a neutral level, reducing noises and minimising strong smells. So if you've got a coffee machine, keep that to one area and just maybe put up a few warnings around the area. Where you can't make changes to the environment, provide as much guidance and as many signs as possible. It helps customers prepare, helps keep them independent and they just know what to expect. Allow areas of the library to have ambient noise and make it clear to other customers that your library is autism friendly, as we've already discussed. This includes tolerance of behaviours, noise and generally asking somebody to move to the louder area if they are being loud and vice versa if they want to sit down quietly and read to move to a quieter area just to keep those consistent areas of the library. 
I'm going to introduce Chelsea now. Chelsea uh, loves going to the library, as does her support worker who's with her today. Um, so welcome, Chelsea. Hello. Um, so I'm with my support worker, Linda. Hello. And uh, we, we have, during the last few months or so have gone to the library together to get yeah. out non-fiction you can come closer yeah, it's okay yeah. you're gonna be a star yeah. <laughs> because, oh. and um one of the things i find hard um at the library is now when the subjects end so um i recently i've been told there's like a, a system but i don't i sometimes don't know where um the distant as the distant markers like something that says one ends and one doesn't uh the other problem is uh the loan times it's like three weeks and it can get very tempting to get another book out um i've got a good reading level and i'm not so i get that and then i'm like oh. so to me i get a little bit like uh yeah i've got like three and i gotta read it with the three weeks so that sometimes so uh uh it is three weeks and gets married. so reading is important so reading time is important to think about and the size of the book i think uh libraries should have frequent uh, activities as you might know I like reading and writing and um, it's currently NaNoWriMo if any of you know what this is um so so that's where I like um like that I wish um there were these types of groups because you've got reading and writing and stuff I'm trying to stay focused on the thing <laughs> uh like a book club for different levels and writing group so they can see where the new writer is making um i think reading groups would be um a good idea because um some people might have lower writing um might have i think a lower reading age to someone that for me wouldn't be appropriate in that is that the right word yeah you you um well, different levels of reading yeah. Yeah. Um, would you'd want something different for each of those levels i think yeah. you're trying to say yeah and then uh, i like that and i think writing groups as um there's the, uh, you enjoy the writing groups it brings you together with other people yeah and it's it, it's a social it? activity yeah. and sometimes we do like social things and that goes to the um so-called special interests where um you know um you can talk about oh let's create a world together or if there was several people doing those um reading groups um you can go oh yeah have you read this one i've just read it in this and it just sort of brings everyone like that and together doesn't it yeah yes a connection yeah so. Yeah, and you, and you come with me and sometimes I, I do, I do come with you. I, I like to get the books as well. I was just, um, one thing I just thought, I don't know if this is the time to say it or not, but I was just thinking about ear defenders. Do the li would the library um, provide ear defenders? Oh, that's a good point. Okay. I thought you were talking about my ear defenders. No, but just, yeah, so... <laughs> In the library. I think this has turned into a uh, question time. Sorry, Linda I, and Chelsea. I sorry, I don't know when that would be appropriate to bring that into the there's, there's a but... Q There's a Q&A at right, that. Right, okay. That's okay. Not right. But, um, yeah, um, that's... Yeah, and um, the last little bit before I could get told off or anything is um, that... Um, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> I don't know what you get it to. Is it going to be part of this? No. All right. Okay. I've forgotten. Right. All right. You might come back to it. Oh yeah. Um. But yeah. Um. We. Oh, yeah. Me. No, I'm not. I'm not coming on to tell you off. I'm just saying, if you think about what you wanted to say, you can mention it in the panel discussion later. So don't worry, it's not gone. Yeah. So um. 
Yeah. You're a user of the libraries, aren't you? Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> the last little bit I was going to say is because um, there's um, sometimes my neighbour gets loud. I have um, tried to do that thing where you go to the library and go into the quiet place of it. So, um, so I've um, so I've gone and tried to do it during this nano remo moment where I've tried to go. I think I did it about twice so far because of like the opening hours and when I have things and I've sort of gone tried to do that. But yeah, there's a cafe next to my local library where I um, got, and then there's of course toilets that are owned from um, uh, yes, Marks so and Spencers. Yeah. No, a waitress, not Marks and Spencers. But yeah, that's where um, that's what mine is. Wonderful. Thank you thing. so much, Chelsea. How many words have you written so far for what? What is it? Nano Rimo or something? Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't do it at, at this um from zero, but it was thirty six. Now I'm on thirty eight. Thirty eight thousand. Yeah, no, 36,000 it started. Yeah. And then it's got to like 48. So I'll wow. complete it. Yeah, it's a lot. Amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chelsea. Chelsea, uh, will be yeah, it's the National the Novel end. Writing. Maria just put that from Barnsley. <gasps> Amazing. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks so much, Chelsea. I love having Chelsea on. Um, so next, I'm going to <laughs> move on to letting everyone know that you're an autism friendly environment. So one of the most important things autistic people and their carers want is understanding. So 80% of people we asked have felt excluded from their community. And if you know that we do autism friendly cinema screenings with the cinema chains across the country, every time we do a piece of research on feedback around those it's just being able to go somewhere where they won't be judged and where they feel safe and now I'm sure you all agree that's exactly what a library should be for people. So share the adjustments you've made and the resources and support that you've got available and also encourage customers to talk to members of staff to find out more and that's autistic customers and non-autistic customers as well. Providing signs, instructions and equipment can really help. Autistic people hate uncertainty and they need to have absolute confidence before entering an environment about where to go and what to do. Quite often they've spent all of their lives trying to abide by societal rules, not wanting to stand out and just wanting to fit in and going into a new place can be really daunting. And if it's not clear what to do as soon as you enter, it just discourages people from going full stop, which is really sad considering libraries are generally inclusive places. So you can really help them and the person that supports them by providing as much guidance as possible. That's written guidance that's printed off and put in the library, perhaps having a bound book by reception or at the entrance that's got all the accessible information in, but also online. And if you've got social media accounts, just make sure you share that regularly so people can see it. Um, some tips and suggestions for these. So it's thinking about how your signs, guidance and maps can link together. Consider colour coding areas of the library or genres of books. Sorrel mentioned that they used colour coding and it's a really fantastic way of just at a glance knowing what you're looking at and where you're supposed to go. Keep imagery and language consistent and avoid adjectives and keep language clear and concise. So just plain English. <laughs> the plain English campaign is probably the best way of going. Using images that relate to the message you're trying to convey are really helpful. They can be um, physical pictures of things that you've got in the library so people know what to look for, or they can even be kind of like clip art style pictures, maybe to indicate the genre of a book. Think a bat or a Dracula for horror, um, a knife or a gun for crime. Those really old fashioned images that we all associate with those different genres is usually the best way of going. Um, avoid bright colours. You'll see on this presentation we've used dark colours on the background and then white. That's high contrast but um, doesn't have the bright colours which can be triggering for some people. And remember that your audience is going to include autistic adults too, so don't just aim to appeal at children. It can be easier to start off because, as Sorrel says, you can go to families and they're all really enthusiastic and they'll tell you exactly what their child needs. But there's so many people who have grown up autistic, diagnosed or undiagnosed, that could really benefit from 
having somewhere to go where they know they're going to be welcome and they don't need to worry. I'm not going to go through this slide, um, but we will be sending all of the slides afterwards. And these are the different signs and information that you can provide for people that will really help your, your visitors and customers. So going a step further, you've thought about how to make the environment sensory friendly. You've thought about having the high activity areas and the quiet areas. Um, and you've also perhaps thought about different ways of making the books identifiable. So having those genre signs and as Chelsea mentioned, making it clear where that genre ends and a new one begins, because sometimes it isn't always apparent. Um, but there are extra steps that you can take to make the experience even more inclusive for your autistic customers. Providing disability positive books. So there are some books that could help all of your customers learn more about autism, disability and differences. There are lots available and research can give you lots of options. There's also a growing movement of autistic authors and illustrators and dimensions can certainly point you in the direction of, P of some books that you might want to make available. Um, our own Michelle here, if you can see on screen, is currently pointed to the book. She's an illustrator herself and I'm sure she'll mention it during the panel discussion. Provide specific times for extra adjustments. So we know people might only feel comfortable in the library when they know it's specifically autism friendly. Um, we do encourage you to be autism friendly all the time, but providing an autism friendly hour or so or day of the week can just give customers the confidence that they're in the right place at the right time and it has been built for them. It gives you the opportunity to implement even more autism friendly adjustments, such as reducing the lighting where it might not be possible at other times, having extra staff on hand to provide support and guidance, providing some sensory equipment, and maybe even having some local organisations at a table to offer advice for people. It also gives a better understanding to your autistic customers about where they can go and what they can do in the library. And it gives you a better understanding as well about who they are. And they might feel a little bit more open to talk to you if it's a specific time where they can come and tell you what they need from the environment. Creating private spaces. Um, so if you've got a spare meeting room or somewhere that you can just have as a private space for people to calm down and de-stress if they do start to experience sensory overload can be really helpful. Sometimes you'll see them flitting back and forth between the main library and the quiet space or just going into that private space to read because they don't want to be in the overwhelming environment surrounded by people and books. Some time to, relax, time to relax can be the difference between a meltdown and a shutdown and having to leave the library or being able to continue their time there. Uh, when I went to a library recently, they mentioned there was a young lad who came to use the computer. And in order to enjoy his experience there, he would have to leave the computer for five minutes and then go back to it and then leave it again, because otherwise he just couldn't sit still, he just couldn't settle and he would have to leave. Create a sensory space. So if you do have a private area that's away from the hustle and bustle, you can create a sensory space. These can be fully funded, amazing sensory spaces that you can potentially get grants for, or you can kind of DIY and do them yourself. So provide some board games and educational books and resources, put in some fidget toys um, and maybe some air defenders. Projectors with calming scenes, fairy lights, floor mats, cushions, bean bags, pop up tents, etc., can all create a comfortable environment. And make sure it's clear that this space isn't a play area for children because that confusion and noise could cause further stress for autistic customers. Um, we also discussed at the last library visit that I did when they have their Lego sessions for children. They'd often see some children take piles of Lego over to a quiet space so they could build in silence because the sound of other children crashing around in the Lego was just too loud. So if you do host events like that, try and stick up some pop-up tents or something or corner a section off where guests can go um, and do their own thing and they've got the freedom to do so. Hosting autism specific events. So when you've got to know your autistic customers, you might want to host events that they'd enjoy. Are some of your customers fascinated with the workings of the railway system? You can ask a local expert in to host to talk about it. Make sure that the person introducing the event explains clearly what's going on though. They need to let guests know what the adjustments are, where the toilets are and who to go to if they've got any queries. Guests also need to know that they are welcome to make noise and move around. 
So when you are hosting events, don't overfill. Make sure there are free spaces for customers to sit, move around, change seats, and mitigate that feeling of being cramped. Ask customers what adjustments they would like in advance and help and let them know that you'll do what you can to accommodate those. So on the booking form or when people come to attend, um, they can let you know what they need and they will tell you what they need. Uh, create a social story or a video to walk through what to do and what to expect at the event. This should include a schedule for the event as well, but make sure that it's reassuring throughout that things might change and things might not go to plan and that that is OK and you will be there to support. Put signs and posters up so it's clear where they are, where they should go and what they're there for. Floor stickers are wonderful and I'm sure we've all appreciated over COVID having arrows on the floor to tell us where to go and where to queue. If it isn't a specific autism event, allow customers who are autistic to come in earlier than the other customers so that they can get settled, figure out where they want to sit and then just generally get used to the atmosphere and invite people directly. Local groups, schools and clubs are a great place to promote your event and receiving a special invite can really help people feel appreciated. And make sure you have everything set up and ready to go before customers arrive so they don't have to come into that sometimes last minute chaos that can happen at these things. During the event, make a quiet space available if they want to leave and calm down a little. Put up signs to show where it is and have someone available to let others know if it's occupied or not. And these events could be open for anybody to come to, with a focus on them being autism friendly. The more of the general public who come to autism friendly environments and events will learn more about autism and be more understanding and welcoming. And we don't want to create that segregation, but some autistic people do feel comfortable going to an event that's specifically for them and for their local group. So have a chat with those people in your area and see what they'd like. Always make it clear that the environment is autism friendly. And if anyone's got any questions, they can speak to a member of the team. Make sure that other customers know that if they feel a guest is making a disturbance or is acting in an erratic or I've used speech marks here, a weird way, to come to you and to talk to you, not to approach the person. Promoting your autism friendly work. So you've done all this brilliant work, but how do you tell people about it? Um, it's key to know it's key for your audience base to grow it's key for your guests to grow and honestly the autistic network is a strong one autistic people and families talk to autistic people and families so they will tell each other what's going on they do need to trust your space and feel confident that your staff team understands autism though so you need to make sure that colleagues have all taken autism training and perhaps have ambassadors at the library who have had that extra knowledge of autism understanding or have got personal experience in it so there's a number of ways you can promote autism friendly libraries to your local community. Don't keep it all online. Provide printed materials and talk to customers locally. Word of mouth really is your greatest asset. Promoting nationally. So you can email Dimensions and let us know you're an autism friendly library. We love to hear um, who's doing what. We can support with local PR and we can share what you're doing across our social media channels and website too. Using your own social media accounts really is a great way to promote your library. And if you can tag on to your local council's social media accounts, or if your local area has a tourist account, or for example, Sheffield has Sheffield is Super, which shares lots of local events, contact them as well and ask them to share what you're doing. And share the work and events that you're holding and provide customer service for any customers who have questions mention it to people who come along um, perhaps they know someone who's autistic statistically they will know someone who's autistic and might want to take advantage of what you're doing and promoting locally in you can reach out to local support services groups schools and publishing on local directories there's a lot of local online directories um, having a positive and proactive relationship with local groups schools and charities is critical not only to help promote your work and have those trusting networks but also so they can support you they can come to your library and they can advise you on what else you can be doing to support people um, and they can perhaps come and do a bit of an audit of your services as well and if they can have stands at the library um, to give advice to people, that's also fantastic as well. And hosting joint events with those groups, invite them to tour the library and say, get the feedback on 
what you can do to improve your library environment. But it might be that there's a local autistic drama group, have them come in and do a play, um, various different things. There's lots going on locally that you might not be aware of yet. And your offline work should support your online work. So if you've posted on a local group social media account, call them to explain a bit more and share flyers that they can distribute. We also recommend that you contact your local authority to access information on local services and organisations and search for your local offer. This is a provision that's made by each local authority to give children and young people with special educational needs and or disabilities and their parents or carers information about what activities and support is available in the area. Oh, I'm sorry, my dog's just started to want to go outside. Thank you um, for listening to me and everybody else speak today. Um, the guide was written in association with Libraries Connected and Logan and Michelle supported as well. <laughs> People that we surveyed across the country. Um, we are available to provide support ongoing to you if you want to get in contact with us. Dimensions is a national not-for-profit. Our main purpose is to support people with learning disabilities and autism, um, but campaigning is a large part of what we do. And we also campaign against hate crime for health equalities and lots of other issues that are important to the sector. We're going to take a very quick break now, just so we can gather the questions that have been asked ready for the panel discussion. We'll take five minutes. I might sedate my dog, to be honest. Um, and yeah, we'll see you soon in about five minutes or so. Thank you. OK, I think we've had five minute break. So um, Sarah was just saying that she, she in her enthusiasm to just uh, to dive into the into the presentation, she didn't introduce herself. So I just want to give Sarah a chance to say who she was before we get going with the panel discussion. <laughs> Hi, I'm the elusive Sarah. Um, I'm campaigns manager at Dimension, so I manage the external face of all of our campaigning work. Um, but I've been working on autism friendly right from when I started over nine years ago. Oh, thanks, Sarah. And um, yeah, that, that was a brilliant presentation. So thank you so much for that. And then um, I, some people couldn't see Michelle's book. So I'm just, just going to ask Michelle if she wouldn't mind just talking about her book. But then, Michelle, if you don't mind showing your book and talking about that, but also a couple of people were asking about terminology and language. And I know you put a response in there. Would you mind sharing your response as well with us once, you, once you've shown us your book? If, if you see that. Just need to unmute, I think so. Yeah, sorry. I, I was sorry. pressing the space bar and it got rid of my video instead of my mute button. Um, so I am Involvement and Engagement Coordinator for Dimensions. Um, I'm also the Autism Ambassador. I was diagnosed a couple of years ago and I have three autistic children, one of them being Logan. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so I've had quite a journey with autism and I run a, a support group called Minecraft and Meltdowns. And I absolutely agree with Sarah and everyone who says contact your local groups. It doesn't necessarily mean the NAS group or the official local group. Contact the parents, get on Facebook. Um, we share and share events that are happening because when we have an autism friendly event, it means people like us can feel like we can go out the house and not be isolated at home. Because when we're in that environment, people get us. We can wear, uh, people can wear chewy gems, they can wear ear defenders, they can lie on the floor. Um, and people won't be staring because they understand. So it helps to reach those isolated families. And on Facebook, I share a lot of, uh, it doesn't have to be Facebook, um, but I, I share a lot of visual posters for events and I never see ones for libraries. So get so get on it and get on the social media and start, start telling us what you've got going on because um, uh, I would love to be able to share what you're doing. Um, invite us to have our meetings uh, in, in your libraries. Um, I know somebody said um, I want to do a sensory event, but I don't want to make it too stressful for other people. If you, if it's at all possible, have a time of the day or a different area of the library where, where one's got ambient noise and maybe a coffee and um, feels more like water stones, a bit more cosy. Um, and the other is I want to read and I, I need some peace and quiet and you know and I want to study. So have different areas if you possibly can. Chelsea's got a thumbs up. Um, my book is this is going to seem like an awful promotion. Um, I illustrated Life Will Never Be Dull with Deborah Brownson, who has written another popular book called He's Not Naughty. Um, if you have a section in your library, have books like this, um, because uh, it, it might help 
um, I, when I do, I, I help um, places like Monkey World and um, uh, uh, local attractions to have autism friendly days, autism friendly environments, um, and they are bonkers noisy. So, so you can definitely do it. Um, and um, when we do that, we, we I always bring recommended books, books that I think that you know parents like, and parents always read them and they love them. And it's a bit of a talking point as well to help people to to start to talk to you. Um, so this is just um, mainly uh, illustrations of how life is. Um, so, you know, look after yourself. Remember to be you. All the silly things that happen in, in our lives. Um, and it's it's positive, autism positive, like Sarah said. Michelle, um, someone said to repeat your book again. It is called Life Will Never Be Dull. That's what I thought. Yeah, it is available in Waterstones, Amazon, all those places to order. Um, but it's not on the shelves, unfortunately. Um, uh, but so there are many books like that, like All Cats Have Asperger's, you know, that those books are just so brilliant and and they help to, to uh, well, get your staff to read them. Um, we, we've had these books on coffee tables in schools because that's what we want people to do is to find out about us. With mm -hmm. regards to the, I'm one of the talky people, if you didn't know, um, <laughs> with regards to the language one, I'm oh. not going to go into it because I'll get triggered. But <laughs> So you you have to ask everyone's individual um you have to ask what their preference is really you can't just assume most autistic people will say I'm autistic because I it's part of me I'm proud of I'm autistic it's not uh, a disease it's not an infliction and I can't be cured from it this is the way I was born um same as if I was um Spanish <laughs> you know I wouldn't I wouldn't say I was a person with Spanish I would say I'm Spanish um, and so uh, the more clinical term with autism, it kind of derived from a place where uh, more clinicians were saying, uh, you know, you have a person and their personality, but they also have autism and it feels slightly negative. So that's why people are tending to move led by autistic people uh, to say we are autistic. But as with pronouns, as with everything, ask, just just don't assume and ask people their preference. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Logan, did you want to add anything about that? Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for a second. All right. That was, that was funny. Uh, no, I, I think mum sort of um, summed it up there. Um, another language um, thing that gets brought up is calling someone like severely autistic or mildly autistic. Um, first of all, that's not a thing, you know, everyone has the same level of autism they're just expressing it differently um and with again with the language like the language thing you don't say someone is severely french you know someone is severely gay or severely left-handed you know they're just they're just left-handed and um also um saying asperger's syndrome is is outdated as well um that's not a term we tend to use anymore because um the scientist asperger's wasn't a very nice person to autistic people mm. Thank you. And and Sarah, you've put your hand up as well. Yeah, um, I'd just like to say a couple of things. So more and more autistic people um, call themselves neurodiverse. And now that's not just autism, it encompasses ADHD and other things. Some autistic people who have ADHD as well will call themselves ADHD, which I quite like. Um, and there's also some lighthearted terms where it's like neurospicy. So if someone comes up to you and says I'm neurospicy, it means um, they're neurodiverse. Um, but also to bear in mind that not everybody's got a diagnosis and not everybody might believe they are autistic until they've got a diagnosis. So if somebody mm -hmm. says I suspect I'm autistic or I'm, I suspect I'm a neurodiverse, believe them, that's just as valid as a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I've got notes that people are raising their hands, but we can't actually see people raising their hands at the moment. So if you could put your comments in the chat, we'll 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 pick up on them. Chelsea, got your hand raised as well. Uh, yeah, I sort of forgot this bit, but um, and I think I told Sarah about it. But there was um, oh yeah, I can drop it now. Um, there was this um. You know, um, I once tried to volunteer for um, a library and I thought, oh, it would be good. You know, you can read, 
of, you know, read the books and st stuff like that, and it will be sort of quiet. But someone actually turned around and said, oh, we don't uh, let autistic people come. Uh, oh, I'm getting looked at by I, yeah, I did not know about this. Oh, okay. okay. First time she hears it. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, they just, and apparently that was to the person that was supporting me to go, and they just said, we don't accept. And I think that was possibly because they were thinking of what is the stare cool typical behavior so they probably thought I would need lots of support or something um and stuff like that and I would actually be able to go and put the books on the thing on the things and do that I I can go and once I've been told the instructions I can do that and I just wanted to say that you know volunteering is sort of like people with um learning difficulties and autism and all that they can they can do volunteering and it's quite mm -hmm. and as we're talking about um um library spaces you know that sort of thing is in there but mm -hmm. making it more autistic friendly but yeah I we're not all the same that's the thing we're not all the same when we have um autistic um no we're not all the same in that sort of sense so some of us could work behind the scenes and do little jobs around mm -hmm. so like that was very important to say yeah and I think that's a really powerful message Chelsea about volunteering because I know that there are there are lots of volunteering opportunities in, in libraries and and they will play to people's strengths and interests and and, and the way they like to work so I think yeah we, we need to remind, remind everyone about that but um the only problem is I might end up reading the books instead of putting them on the thing. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's always a good thing in our view. Um, Michelle, you were talking about um, uh, autistic people and events in libraries and, and sensory events. Do you want to have a, some thoughts about that? Yes, I, I used to, when I lived in Southampton, I ran the Big Day Inn, uh, which was a huge event where we took over an entire church with all of its rooms and meeting rooms and hall. Um, for autistic families and this was getting people out of the house um, in, into an environment where they could be themselves and we had tons and tons of robots, Lego, board games, um, electronics, 3D printing and all sorts of things for uh, the families to enjoy and at the same time we had the NAS group, the local autism groups, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, local groups you know dis or disability friendly groups there so that parents could connect with them because they're often stuck in the house they can't get out to to reach people we had councils and all sorts there and the libraries the Southampton libraries supported us so well and every single year they came and they provided our sensory room so we had a very very quiet room for them uh shoes, we had a shoe park at the front door so you take your shoes off as soon as you come in and we had a whole pile of shoes it was hilarious um, and in the quiet room, they just put up a gazebo inside the room, fairy lights, bubble tubes, and they bought loads and loads of books and all of their equipment that, that, that had funded uh, for their own sensory rooms. So you can, as a library, you can use your outreach and, and go to where these events are happening and provide their sensory space or or that, that quiet space. And I know lots of groups are doing it and lots of libraries are doing wonderful things. Um, and it also doesn't have to cost you a fortune either, because I know someone in the chat said, you know, well, how much does it cost for training and, and how much does it cost to get a video? Um, I provide training for free. You know, local local advocates, autistic families, autistic people will will just come and, and would love to help you to provide the right environment for people. Um, and, and when we say autism friendly, it also includes people with dementia, people with sensory sensitivities, um, brain injury, and anything where a quieter, clearer environment might help them. Um, and Logan would go and uh, do films for our local board game cafe, uh, you know, for the price of a, a free drink or a cup of tea, you know, give us give us some freebies in your library or something like that. You know, it, it just use what you already have and reach out to those groups it, it doesn't have to cost the world don't mm -hmm. don't get experts in they'll they'll charge you a fortune <laughs> <laughs> thanks michelle um one of the questions that's been picking being picked up well actually there are two things 
uh, uh, one is about the book. There's been so many book recommendations coming into the chat. So I think we definitely need to pull all those together and, and recirculate those. So we'll make sure we do that because that's a, I love these these webinars where everyone contributes their their experience and knowledge and ideas and suggestions it's a it's really useful so yeah so we'll they, did, sure those. they did that at my local library where they had a list and I tried to take it and I don't know what happened to it but yeah <laughs> lists are quite good yeah brilliant yeah yeah we'll make sure we, we pull that together and, and circulate that um so because I think that's that's real oh, yeah loads of loads even more coming in as, as we speak one of the interesting things that just came into the chat while we were talking about volunteering um and there were actually as, as well in the chat lots of examples of, of people uh of libraries who have autistic people volunteering and working in their libraries but um just just some advice from particularly from Michelle Logan and Chelsea about what makes it a good working environment what 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 helps you to, to volunteer uh, or work comfortably and, and what would help you in a library? So um so we should start with should we start with um should we start with Chelsea because you were the one that, that kicked off that conversation. What would make it a, a nice place for you to work in? Um see I don't know, I can't quite recall it, but um I'll, I'll explain um, one of the uh, volunteering opportunities I do to transfer it. Um, I do the local pantry and I like, and they found out that I like doing this. So I like going through like the dates and sort of stuff. So we got to divide the food. So I, I guess sort of like doing those sort of jobs. Um, I, I'm sort of, I'm sort of that person that would um, happily sit there going through all the books. Like if you told me to go and find, separate all the books by author, I think, you know, I could do that and I like, understand it. Sometimes I call it like I um, have adopted someone like, you no, know, no, you're claimed now. And um, when someone ends up saying, oh I have an autistic child or a thing I'm like you're clean now you can't you can't go I'm, I'm gonna keep you <laughs> like or <laughs> nephew or so and so that understanding of it all and um you know um you know people I always quite like it when there's people that are a bit open that do it and go yeah mm. all right <laughs> you know take a break you know it's like that sort of thing like I can imagine jobs um, in a library would be going like putting the books on the shelf. Mm. Now I would I would be that person that would come back and go, where was it again? And then go uh, back. That's where I think. But um, I think I've sort of worked out where the non ref what is it, the non fiction non -fiction. bit? Yeah, yeah, we know the non fiction aisles right. sort of now. Where <laughs> which side of the library they are on now? I, I haven't think quite worked out. <laughs> But for, for, for most libraries, I think you'd be gold dust, Chelsea, because but somebody who wants to put the books in order <laughs> and keep them in a tidy order is something that every library needs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's like the sort of thing. But um, yeah, I I would find it a little bit hard if there was something unexpected, like or I couldn't work out where to define it. So if I looked at some books and went like when I did charity shops like where does this one go like if you have a, a book like a separate the fantasy book from another type of fantasy book and I'm like they're going I don't know how to separate it you need to get through <laughs> it that's what I would find but yeah unexpected thank you, thank you. Helpful. Thank you yeah. Logan have you got any thoughts about what makes it what would make it a comfortable working environment for you if I were to be a volunteer at a library. Yes. Um, the option to um, have my phone and headphones would be certainly helpful um, because um, I need I need to have something on in the background, um, like a podcast or some lo-fi music. And um, if, if it being on my phone, that means I can control it. Um, but yeah, I'd be perfectly happy just like <laughs> sort of putting books on the shelves and stuff um but also like I, I think I'd probably be happy to talk about 
specific kinds of books that I know about like mm. I'd pay them to do that <laughs> you know <laughs> to let me do that um you know like um I'd be happy to talk to people about um authors and book recommendations um or film recommendations those sort of sorts of things mm. that sounds like a yeah and uh, that that that, that is, is such a powerful uh tool and powerful <laughs> I think that trigger it. sorry sir no, I think no. that trigger one um I think Logan might agree is when when you get onto your favorite subject or a thing you know quite well or mm. you go oh I know where this section is <laughs> like <laughs> this is my favorite section that I've <laughs> nearly read half the books on or something like that and, but and um get... those those bits of oh I don't know like if someone wanted to come over and ask us um ask someone um wouldn't, wouldn't you say if they ask oh I don't know about this sort of fantasy a genre or something and we know mm -hmm. about that genre or something yeah yeah so that your expertise would be really really useful mm -hmm. I think that that's really helpful between the two of you about sort of avoiding things that were unexpected and and yeah. uh, but, but, but using your expertise and your areas of interest and it, we've been asked to come to a Barry library and <laughs> I'm going to Essex and I, I, we're, we're gone Logan. <laughs> yes you won't be short of offers now. Michelle have you got any thoughts about that? Uh, yes part, part of my role is to help people to work and I mean absolutely do they have to be volunteers if you've got some jobs mm. going pay us mm. you know we're mm. normal people um dis disabled people don't have to just be volunteers um but i appreciate that might be the only opportunity you have open i'm just saying just don't mm. um put us in that box but absolutely experience i so agree with you if i want to buy a diy tool you know i could get it off amazon but if i went to my local diy shop there'll be somebody there going oh no you don't want to use that you want this one for that job and they would tell me about it and they would help me do that same with books you might have trouble getting us to shut up if it's if it's our special interest but um <laughs> but um I hate that word special I mean hobby not special interest um in terms of helping someone to be employed um maybe give them a trial interview instead of a mm. formal sit down at a table interview so come in for a day work with us and, and that's your interview person Michelle there's that one of like a working interview where that's they right. go and that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, some some places like um, Hampshire Constabulary, they give out questions in advance um, mm. and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, give out those questions, reduce that that time when you're put on the spot and you, and you completely go to pieces. You've got a chance to compose yourself and think what you're going to say. Yeah. Use easy read instructions, easy read terms of reference, contracts and um, make it really, really plain English. You know, my lunch break will be at 12. I will not eat in the library, I will eat here, you know, pictures, lots of picture, pictorial guides um, for your customers as well. As much mm. information as you can give them in advance of coming to the library, the better. This is what our sensory area looks like. This is the map. This is where you can find, this is the person who will help you. You know, it, it's just as much information as you can, because as we've said, everyone's got different needs. So if we have the information, we can plan our day. Mm. Um, clear instructions as well. Um, so say what you mean you know um, if, if we're doing something not right like for example chewing gum and, and you don't have you, your staff aren't allowed to do that tell us you know to help I, us support us I, I I also remember that I wanted um, on the on the work experience program that I was on the parent which is part of project search they said oh the library was a bit like oh we don't want people overtaking our jobs and we're like yeah, but I would have loved to do that instead of doing what I did on the work experience when I look mm. back and, you know, why mm. why can't we um, have work experience? You know, it sounds like common sense, you know. Mm. Mm. Yeah, of course. Um, Sarah, got your hand up. And you're... I had to do it. I, so, somebody <laughs> had to do it. Um, I'd also like to say that if you are managing somebody who's autistic, kind of play it by ear so it might be that that this is their first opportunity for employment so they don't know how they want to be managed it might be that having um face-to-face one-to-ones is very difficult so try a walking one-to-one -one or a working one-to-one -one. um 
ask them questions in advance so they can send their answers to you in advance and don't so they aren't put on the spot because I certainly know managing people and being managed myself how are you doing at work you clam up and you go blank and you think I'm fine I guess or if you're told about changes that are happening it's a bit of a shock to begin with so you kind of go into what I call drama mode and then when you've had chance to process it properly it starts to become more manageable and palatable and you'll find that you'll try some things and they won't work so you try something else and you work Mm -hmm. at it until it works and something that worked last month might not work this month it's just being flexible and working together Mm -hmm. which is the most important thing Mm -hmm. thank you Sarah and I think that thing about the interviews is really important we're looking at how we recruit people for our libraries generally because you know we want to build a much more diverse uh, workforce for our libraries and and so we're looking at different ways of recruiting to reach different people and and just build a a much more diverse library workforce so that was really helpful sorry can I just 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 put in before because I meant to say Mm. before and I completely forgot you'll probably find that a lot of your colleagues and volunteers are autistic Mm. it's generally a sector that we come to it makes us happy um and not everybody will have a diagnosis. People mm. might suspect uh, it might cross over with ADHD, particularly mm. in women. There can be very similar traits. Um, so maybe just take a step back with your team and think about autism traits and how you can relate. And it, you might find that when you make your library autism friendly, some of your staff really start to thrive. Yeah, indeed. And I just noticed Caitlin put in the chat that she's autistic and, and how she, how her experience of working in the library, which is really interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Caitlin. So right at the beginning of your, your presentation, you were talking about how you'd engaged with, with the community and got people to come into your libraries. Um, could you, and I know there was a question about how you, how you reached out to the community and how you've continued to do that. Would you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, we particularly used the um, any professional links that we could find because that, that was where we had to start working for a council. We knew that there was a SEND special educational needs team. You know, we knew that there would be educational psychologists that work within schools. And so that was our route through, you know, because in, in a way people can't ignore you. <laughs> um, so we started going down that route and working with those colleagues, they then put us in touch with adults and families mm. I, as I now know to say autistic people yeah so we and uh, then then as Michelle has said the um, the network just spread and the news spread we attended there was a an autism conference I'm, I'm not sure how many authorities have that kind of thing um, we attended that we made sure we spoke to anybody that would listen to us really and, and promoted what we were trying to do Mm. but there's something about having a vague plan but the so that you have a a a bit of a pitch that you can talk to people about but it not being overwhelming and it being flexible enough to listen and to change and and to build upon what people what feedback you're receiving Mm. Mm. yeah yeah so and, and keeping it going I think it is so yeah I think that's really important yeah I, yeah I mean I just while while I'm talking I, I do think you know it's been absolutely amazing today I, I've really enjoyed listening to everybody but but I I would hold on to the 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 point that I tried to make that a famous phrase of mine really you have to put your gig, big girl pants on you if you want to do this and you really want to have a go have a go Mm. if you keep keep like oh well oh no I, I better do it that way or better do it that way or what did that person advise about that what was that term and it starts to get overwhelming it starts to get really frightening mm. but just have a go and at least by starting and having a go with what you've got you know you, we've all got um a different library space um all of our libraries are different all of our communities are different So you just have to, you know your community, you know your space, you know your staff, and you've just got to try. And if you don't quite get it right, you use the wrong word or you haven't got the right books or you haven't, it doesn't matter because you're on a journey and you've started. Mm. 
Mm. And I would really don't get almost in a way, don't get put off by all this stuff that you've heard today. You know, just just go for it. Mm, yeah and you're getting a lot of thumbs up there as well and I think um that what Michelle said about just asking people as well is really important mm. isn't it and just talking to people uh, whoever whoever they are we really need to talk and listen and understand each other don't we so Logan um we, a couple of people have asked you to talk a bit more about what you said about Asperger's syndrome would you mind just saying a little bit more about that yeah I was just reading those um so essentially, um, it, it's different for everyone. So if someone introduces themselves and say that they have Asperger's syndrome, um, you don't have to be like, I'm actually, it's not called that anymore. Like you just sort of go, go along with, uh, with that. But it's mainly essentially if you're talking about autism, you'll say autism, because it's generally not something, a word we use anymore because we don't respect the person that it came from. Um, but it, it to do with the history, Logan. Yeah, Asperger's was a scientist who experimented on um, autistic boys. Um, he, so he sort of like, you know, before we discovered what things were, you know, there was never a name for things, you know, but it's, it's always existed like before um, Asperger's came around. But um, he, he sort of had a very negative um view on it so he wasn't trying to help them he was like trying to see what it was and how to take advantage of it essentially um oh I forgot what I was gonna say um in in my case when I was diagnosed I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome so it's a very recent thing to have um come about so um some people when they were diagnosed they might have also been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and they're just used to saying that so yeah mm -hmm. sort of if it's a personal thing, go with what the person prefers. But if you're talking generally about autistic people, then say autism. Thank you. And Michelle, just add something to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just wanted to add also to what Sarah said as well about people not necessarily having a diagnosis. So as I said, I was diagnosed a couple of years ago. Um, really, autism wasn't really a term until the 80s, although there have been autistic people uh, forever. Um, so in, it's only been a couple of generations where it's, it's really started to be, um, uh, people start to be, become aware and people aren't, there aren't more autistic people. It's just that people know what to look for. So after my three children were diagnosed, I thought, ah, <laughs> so I went to get my diagnosis and that took years. And some people um, are waiting and waiting for help, waiting for diagnosis. For some people, it's too exhausting. They can't go through with that. In the autistic world, uh, in our community, people who don't have a diagnosis are just as valid as everybody else because we know that there are so many barriers in, in getting one uh, and such an enorm enormous waiting list. And girls especially get um, underdiagnosed because we present differently and we mask really, really well. And they're looking for things that Hans Asperger found in 12 boys. So, you know, it's, 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 there's a lot of work to do there. Um, some people don't also go for diagnosis because it can restrict your um, employment mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in future. So it, there are many reasons. So just, yeah, it's just as valid to not have a diagnosis. And like I said, it's anyone with sensory sensitivities, uh, dementia, ADHD, or any other condition where a sensory friendly environment would help them. They're all welcome. Mm -hmm. I, I also to add on Michelle I also um when I got diagnosed I was diagnosed as a child so I was definitely under 10 when it it happened so it's it's very different when you grow up with it um and having the support and then growing up without the support and I think sometimes the autism friendly areas might help those who haven't also um had that experience and it's like everything's so different to when I was younger growing up with autism friendly things it's like I had to like still had the same experience as that but yeah mm, thank you interesting it's really interesting and there's lots of chat about when when people are diagnosed and I, th I think the thing you were talking about Michelle around 
the difference between the diagnosis of boys and girls is quite an interesting one as well and and the way that girls present and i i, I know that some of the books that i've been reading recently are from uh, from autistic authors have been about girls and the way they they've had to mask their 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 experiences which is, which is really, it's, it's really interesting and, and yeah challenging as well um there are two two things that are going on in the chat one's about social stories and the other's about ear defenders and earplugs um so uh, should we just talk a little bit about ear defenders and earplugs and i think there are a couple of things about what what's best and also about you know having them in libraries and sharing them and and what what are the what are the challenges around that and, and what what everyone would prefer so i don't know if anyone wants to come in and, and reflect upon that sorry i was busy typing away is this around sorry. ear defenders and equipment yeah and things? yeah, yeah. Um, I, I blame I, I blame linda for a <laughs> ear defenders. Um, we were actually having a chat with kirkley's libraries yesterday around this and it's going to be dependent on your budget so if you've got very limited budget you might decide to put that into other equipment that could reduce sound as i meant as i've answered one of the questions bean bags and soft furnishings and room dividers and pop-up tents and things can be really good at reducing noise levels if you think of the difference of going into an empty room versus going into a nice furnished room um, we decided with kirkley's that chances are with ear defenders um, and the specialized cushions and things that the autistic people have them themselves and might not like to share that equipment. They'll have mm. their own special fit. They'll get used to it around their head. But if you find that you have perhaps undiagnosed autistic people coming in that don't have that equipment, they might want to try it out and see if it actually helps. I know myself and Logan, we both use um, headphones and have music and podcasts going through the ears because that's the only way that we can go out into the real world. Um, so yes, potentially, if you've got the budget to do so, Chelsea's got her hand up, um, but I wouldn't put it as a priority. Mm. You can have sound machines, like the white noise machine, because apparently they're meant to mask noise. So I sometimes do it when my neighbour gets a little bit loud, I try and put the um, white noise machine and it can get rid of the voices. So you could have that in the one corner. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, Michelle? Yeah, just wanted to say on a technical level, there's a difference between ear defenders and noise cancelling headphones. Um, so ear defenders are, are they're sort of trying to block out all the noise. They're very cheap um, and you can get them from B&Q, all sorts of places. Noise cancelling headphones specifically cut out the frequencies of all noise apart from the human voice. So you can talk just like I am to somebody wearing noise cancelling headphones and they'll be able to hear you just as clearly but it's cancelling out all the other noise that's going on in the background just to make it easier for them to concentrate on what you're saying mm, um you. did you want me to talk about the social stories yes you might as well go on to that because there's some yeah. discussion in the chat at Hertfordshire library specifically social stories but yes yeah. it'll be really good to talk about sort of yeah, you know, how they use what's what what was best you know how you how you make the best of our social stories yeah absolutely oh and and with ear defenders i did say um people like sarah said will have their own and they will want to use their own but it, i wrote in i wrote in the chat if you have a poster up that says ear defenders are welcome here and this is because some people find this noise you know difficult so people are staring less and people who want to wear them feel welcome um with um uh, social stories it, it doesn't have to be a specific um branded thing you don't have to get an expert to do it but essentially be very very clear in what you want to say so don't use jargon uh, don't use lots of punctuation just very very clearly say um as i sort of mentioned earlier so have a picture of your loose and say the loose are here you know have a photo of it uh, there is a noisy hand dryer in this one the disabled loo does not has tissues does not have a noisy hand dryer um you can borrow a book from here and just it's just a really easy read document um you can create a guide somebody in the chat said you know can we do the front doors absolutely um somebody's trip to the library will start from the bus journey in you know they've, they've been through a lot to get to you 
but what you can do in advance is say right the library looks like this we're open on these times um we have special events on these times so you might want you know they might want to avoid it if it's noisy um and then when you go in it looks like this and here's our staff and some of you have already done this um so it's, it's just really really simple um not being patronizing not not being childish about it just plain english i think we i think we also like sometimes we do like to be, well for me we do like to be like positively overwhelmed no i'm not overwhelmed like positively stimulated like if there's a social group out there and being social i think that's also important to say because we can be social like going to the groups and knowing they're on and saying yeah you can come you can come that's also important to like do that um i'd say for social stories it's really important to put that things might not go to plan or it might be busier than we have said that it's going to be and that's okay and to talk to somebody if you want to um Videos are also also really good. When you think of a video of an introduction to a building, you think of a really fancy, specially put together video, but it doesn't have to be. Get your mobile phone out and record it. Um, we appreciate anything. Mm. And it also quite many community libraries aren't in a dedicated library building. They are in other buildings or community centers, or perhaps, next to another building one that i visited in dewsbury was right next to mecca bingo and if you didn't know you were looking for the library it could be difficult until they'd got a nice new installation outside that said library um so Ours make sure is by that waitrose. That's it. yeah so put those other identifying you can get a food. factors you can get... <laughs> you've got waitrose and then you've got the cafe upstairs so basically you can walk out of the library get the cafe for lunch <laughs> And what I did, yeah, go into the, the waitress loo, then come back in and you can carry on with the day. Are you getting, are you getting like hungry, Chelsea? Is it coming up to lunchtime? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's like that. You've got that sort of thing. And if you really plan it, you can go and do your shopping after. <laughs> So yeah, other identifying buildings and features and things to help people to find their way. Mm. Um, and if you do have information about which bus services are stopped nearby and where that bus stop is, that can be really helpful. Because like Michelle says, the journey starts before they even leave the house. And if you don't drive and you're using public transport, it can be really daunting going somewhere you've never been before to know where to get off when do you press mm. the stop button for the bus where does the bus stop turf you off how far away is it from where you need to go do you turn left or right and so as much information as possible and videos are great for that because you don't really have to do much you just have to walk it yeah thank you um we've got we've got we've got uh chelsea then michelle so i forgot to say this i found out that linda no, I already knew this. Linda used to work in the library, but apparently she did it so back in the day that they had it on the cards. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was handwritten onto cards. So before the computers. Wow. So yeah, it's a long time ago. A lot has changed since then. She wow. lets me know about this. <laughs> Brilliant. That's great. Thank Every you. time and we go. <laughs> <laughs> well it's, 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 a, it's a good it's a good it's a good skill to have those those very basic library skills of the, they still they still they're still useful and um i just i'm just seeing in the chat that quite a few people are sharing their their um their their social stories as well and and someone's asked the transcripts of the track and i think yeah we really need to share the transcripts of the track there's so much useful stuff in there michelle can i come to you because you had your hand up as well um, yeah, um, so somebody was saying about having what's it like um, experiences before the library and absolutely if you have the budget, if you've got a grant, um, you can go to some organisations and they will do a walkthrough for you. Um, Logan does this as part of his work with Alltech. You want to talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as well as working for um, Dimensions, I also work as an animator for Alltech. Um, and what Autech do is they provide virtual tours for certain um, areas like vaccination centres, libraries, schools. And that's basically, it's like Google Maps, but on the inside of buildings. So um, you can click around the building, go into different rooms. And in some rooms, there'll be a little video explaining what happens in that room. 
Um, and it's basically a really good way to see the venue and what goes on before actually um, entering it. All right. That sounds really interesting, really powerful. I, I was going to say, well, we've got um, another webinar, just as a plug, on the 7th of December with a Ewan's Guide who are looking at accessibility in libraries. So, um, yeah, do look out for that if, you, if, you're, if you're interested in, in looking at accessibility issues as well. Um, sorry, that was just a quick quick plug <laughs> for, from me. Um, but we have an interesting question from Jenny who says we have an autism assessment clinic based in our library. Any tips for making it a better experience? And particularly, I think you, Jenny, you're thinking about the sort of waiting area as well outside the outside that assessment centre. So, any thoughts from any of you about that? So, I would say, um, yeah, take take have a think about some of the the chat when you get the presentation later have a, have a look through there's lots and lots of advice there and um, you can't everyone's different and you can't you can't suit what everybody needs but the best thing you could do is give information in, in advance so give us much information in advance so that a family can plan their own day mm -hmm. so they'll know if a coffee machine in a place is going to be too stressful and they'll plan where else to sit so they're, they're the experts they know what they need um, so what you can do is just tell them what it's it's going to be like as much as possible. And I think that's a great idea that you've got a waiting room um, that you use as a, uh, in the library, um, because absolutely this is a great place for them to be. So perhaps tell them to give more time so that they've got a chance to look around uh, before or after the appointment. Mm, yeah, okay, thank you. Wow, we've, we've, we've covered so many questions. I'm just going back to some of the earlier discussions that we had. Oh, Sorrel, it was a, there was a question right at the beginning about displaying photos of staff and the importance of that so that people knew who they were going to be seeing when they came into the library, but how, how a question about how staff felt about that. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't welcomed with open arms um, to start off with, but we we spent some time trying to explain to staff the benefit that that would bring um, and and that it was a, an integral part really of the work that we were trying to do. Also, we knew we'd been to a dementia friendly library in, I think it was up in Wakefield, and that was one of their key things as well was to have images of staff so that people could see them. And it was just unpacking it really and, and saying well what what actually is the difference with having a photograph on a wall a still photograph as opposed to somebody walking in and and seeing you face to face mm -hmm. um, and and we just we just slowly whilst they were doing the training it was part of the ongoing conversation about um about getting the library ready I think in the end, every, everybody agreed. Obviously, if somebody really, really, really didn't want to, then then we wouldn't have been able to force them to. But everybody did agree, and and we did it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's great, and yeah, I think it is about that staff staff awareness, isn't it? And staff. Yeah, it was building their understanding, really. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Um, um, feedback just... I've had from working with other libraries, not feedback, but um, observations I've made is quite often library staff don't have a uniform so it isn't clear who you can talk to and walking through a library to get to a reception desk can be quite daunting in itself mm -hmm. especially if there's no one behind that reception desk to ask so we recommend that staff wear lanyards or a badge or something to identify them very clearly to people that they are staff there and they aren't just members of the public looking at a book um, and on that, if you do have an autism ambassador or someone who's got a special connection and extra knowledge, have that on that lanyard as well. Say, ask me about autism friendly and things like that on there. It'd be really beneficial. Mm. We put them in hives and lots of <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Chelsea. <laughs> I think I've seen the odd um, beans sort of um, ones around their neck. Yeah, yeah. And, and somebody's also just put in the chat, is there a crossover between yeah, autism friendly and de dementia friendly libraries? Sorry, yeah. sorry, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, can I answer? Sorry, yeah, I, 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 I very much believe from a library's perspective, what 
the things that you mm-hmm. you do oh, this whole presentation has all been around autism but when you start to think in your head about what you're doing and the changes that you're making you, you're helping people who have low literacy you're helping people who have dementia and possibly get confused or or want to remember the name who is it who was that who is it that I'm seeing and if they can see a picture that helps there are many things that many of the changes particularly that I talked about help everybody yeah um yeah even somebody that's just busy and in a rush it's easier to make their way around if things are are, are clearer and color coded Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. so yes that it's not just I think as you if you are taking it forward and building on it this isn't this is something that is easier access for everybody yeah absolutely yeah. and it helps Sarah. people with who are anxious um and uncertain um i always try and give the scenario of imagine you've turfed up at a foreign airport and you yeah. don't understand anything yeah. that's going on and it's really really busy and you've got no plan to what to do or who to talk to and think about what would help you in those scenarios and also to think back to covid pandemic the floor stickers and the signs and the arrows and the information beforehand and the staggered entry were all really helpful for neurodiverse and neurotypical Mm. people um so absolutely the adjustments kind of do tie in together but remember that autism isn't the same as dementia they're two very different Mm. things yeah (laughs) thank you um i've got a question as well that's about that that kind of sort of linked to the pandemic in a way but lots of library public library services these days are doing either hybrid events that are either in person and online or just online events and I I'd love to know what your experience is I mean obviously here we are all online talking talking on Zoom today but what what your experiences of online events and what would make online events really accessible for autistic people are are there barriers that that are in the way that that libraries could learn learn about from you Michelle Um, At the start of the pandemic, um, we started to run um, staying in touch clubs for um, people across the yes, which were awesome, Chelsea, um, uh, which we're still running because people love them. Um, Mm. Autistic people, I worked from home anyway, and I um, autistic people, this is this is our environment. We can wear slippers, you know, comfy clothes. We can control our environment. This is wonderful. So actually online events can be wonderful ways to access the library or to listen to a speaker, you know, and then and then they could come into the library to borrow the book that they heard about. But but a lot of the experience of the library, they might they might be able to get online, which is mm. another wonderful way to to access it. Um, for people who had lower mobility, we 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 helped them a lot. So we gave them things like um, big uh, pens, stampers that they could use to press buttons on the keyboard. Um, you know somebody there with them to help them mute and unmute um, not having crazy backgrounds is you know um, just thinking about that kind of advice um, asking we, we have a guidance where we say you know speak one at a time like we are doing today put your hand up um, and um, try not to have background noise and if you do go on mute so just trying to make that online environment really friendly as well and I just wanted to add, um, I know, Sorrel, you, you managed to get your wonderful staff to have their photos up and, and be contactable. And, and as you said, if they don't want to be, that's that's also fine. You could have some members of staff who might be autistic, um, like Phil says, in a great environment. Um, but um, they might not want to be contacted or, or when they're focused, they, they might not want to be helping people. So you could have, you know, badges or, or something that says, you know, ask me about. Um, and and it's okay to ask those staff when they're wearing that. I think mm-hmm. also like hybrid um sort of things within the, um the thing, like uh going in in person and then also like being online depending on your mood. I think that's quite important because since the pandemic started I've moved to place so of course I also sometimes want to get out and not be online all the time so that's important for me um to do and then sometimes I might want that day when I do it online you know because I can't be bothered to walk up to the library because I'm lazy (laughs) 
Sorry. And as um, I mentioned yeah. to somebody who asked a question about um, autism friendly hour or having appointments, it might be that somebody commits to going to an event or appointment, but just the pressure of having committed to that in itself can be a huge barrier to going mm -hmm. or something might happen that triggers them that day and they just can't face leaving the house. So if there's a backup alternative to joining online, um, then absolutely, if that is mm -hmm. available. Thank you. Uh, Logan, any thoughts from you? Um, I'm sorry, I was reading the chat. What were we talking about? It's all right. It was about, it was about the um, online you, libraries and online activities and events and, and so on and, and what makes them act really accessible, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, I've heard from some people um, it's not as accessible because um, it's not as predictable as being in a room full of people because people have different backgrounds. Uh, some people um stay muted and some people don't so for some people it can be um quite stressful but um for other people such as myself um I really like it because um I'm sort of uh free to make my own environment you know I've got my um background on at the moment I'm wearing panda slippers because I can <laughs> and um you know I can also adjust um the volume of my computer you know if someone's talking too loudly I can turn it down or alternatively which is something that you can't do in real life so um yeah there are definite benefits to having online events mm. oh, great thank you if you'd have asked us this question before the pandemic you would have got a very different answer <laughs> I, it's made me think back to the first couple of events that we hosted online at the start of the pandemic when no one really knew how to use zoom or teams we had such very strict structures of you will join at this time we will start at this time this is how you do it. This is what you do if you want to talk. Whereas now it's kind of a bit more intuitive for many people. Um, but it is also worth bearing in the mind that like coming in person, some people will need support um, and having those online events. Sometimes someone will need support mm. to access the online events. Um, if somebody's not great with typing they will feel like they can't get involved in the chats just like we've got a very active chat here and um, the downside of webinars is somebody who's not great with typing can't come on camera and say something so there's barriers as well thank you um, Sarah, right there somebody's asking the chat about is there any support available for people who who who, are, who worry about interviews um who are who are autistic and just, just is that is there any advice or guidance available? I'm not aware of anything specifically, but there probably is out there. To be honest, um, there's so many self advocacy organisations that do easy read information like that. I'm not aware of anything specific. Michelle, have you come across anything in your role? Um, no, that's something I've been on the other side of. So I'm I'm on the interview panel helping them to make the environment. Um, more autism friendly or, or certainly stress friendly um, because everybody wants the best out of you in an interview and they want you to be comfortable. Um, I'm sure there's stuff out there um, but it could be something we could look at as well. Mm, thank you. Sorrow. Yeah, yeah, particularly I've just seen a, another message in the chat, sorry, in the account, um, councils, you know, it, Bendo absolutely try really, really hard to make our recruitment processes as open as possible. And, but it, 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 the offer is there that if people want to talk about things before, uh, before they apply, before they fill a form in, you know, it's worth, it's worth contacting and having a chat and, and mm -hmm. talking it through with somebody. And I know that's difficult, but with anonymized recruitment, which many of us now do, um it's really really important that you take up that offer and many many councils mm -hmm. and large organizations um across across the country mm -hmm. will give that offer of support but you do need to to contact and, and explain mm -hmm. and, and have a chat through with with the recruitment department okay thank you i think we've probably got time for just one more final quick question and it's a little bit about sort of sensory areas and making sure that sensory areas are, are not, or, or actually storage for sensory equipment as well, that it's not overwhelming um, because it can be very.
bright and, and lots of flashing lights and all sorts of things. And so, so I just really ask to throw out to the panel, any thoughts about sensory areas in libraries? Sarah, should I start with you and then? To be honest, I think she'll probably go straight to Michelle. She's got more experience with this okay. from her events and things. Okay, well, let's go to Michelle. Michelle, if <laughs> you've got any. Yeah, keep it gentle. Um, have a bubble tube that gently changes colour. Don't have flashing lights. Um, from for children in schools, you know, let them have a fidget toy, but maybe not something that's annoying, like a fidget spinner or something that's noisy for other people. Mm. So, so have a sensory environment where, you know, um, for example, at Monkey World, we have a big gazebo underneath it, lots of cushions and blankets, and then lots of little individual pop-up tents. Um, some with fairy lights, some without, you know, just so people can just go find their own environment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just let people choose, really. Brilliant. Thanks. Like, like, like um, soft sponge walls and stuff like that, because that gets the hand going, doesn't it? Yeah. I know people like to have those things that they can they can hold on to, don't they? I mean, everybody does. I, I remember being at a, a training session where we were all given those just just to help us sort of focus on the training session and it was a, it made an amazing difference. Linda's so, also made the comment of it has to be washable because mm -hmm. some people do um uh physic um a, a stim with their mouth which stimming which is what some of them do like you see that with um mm -hmm flapping hands and, and rocking and stuff but yeah so that that's also important as we're like in a post-covid world where you know we're aware of how germs and stuff things so you know absolutely yeah. and it's got to do the job of um, working <laughs> that down just just to add to that as well um autistic people don't stop being autistic when they're 18 so mm. um, in the offices um, we have a box of thinking toys just like you said so um, putty and coloured overlays and just things to fiddle with. Um, and it's not for autistic people, it's for everybody. Yeah. And, and, and anything that you provide, a sensory space, adults will go in there and they might lie down and read a book and that's fine. And just make that acceptable um, that that's okay to do that because yeah, you don't grow out of autism. <laughs> The good thing about I these webinars it. is it's online and you can't see that I'm currently fidgeting with a bubble and I've been doing it throughout the whole thing. I, I think I think also because of our organisation dimensions, because we have learning disabilities and autism, I, I, I swear it attracts people that like like end up that are like the staff I've noticed come and it like tracks them <laughs> like okay another staff's dyslexic <laughs> or an another one's got autism or another one's neurodivergence and you're like yeah it sounds about right um, I just want to add yeah. to the sensory room side of things and mm -hmm. um, perhaps a question for Michelle as well actually so if we often get questions about suppliers of sensory objects and things you don't necessarily need to go to a formal supplier for them. You can be imaginative and you can get light projectors off Amazon in all places. Yeah, and you can get stress balls and fidget toys from Amazon in all places. It doesn't oh. have to be a formal supplier. Mm. Top, top, um, the entertainer and stuff like that. Yeah, and mm. beanbags and things like that and cushions and pop-up tents. Ikea is amazing. Mm. Um but I do want to put a warning out there and perhaps, Michelle, if you've got any advice or feedback on this is safety. I know that Amazon can be a dangerous place for buying non-EU mm. approved yeah. things that could, especially if people are putting them in their mouths. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you've got any advice, Michelle, on how to identify tap from safe fidget toys. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You're going to have to go with safe. Um, there are there are places that you can buy um toys from, and they cost a fortune. So absolutely, I I go to places like Flying Tiger. Um, mm. exercise equipment like sports bands that you stretch are wonderful. Weight Tiger, I like that yes, one. Yeah, exactly. And the and the section in IKEA where you've got those sorts of things. Um, I yeah, I'd buy from a, a reputable British seller. Um. And also um, some of the um, equipment can be expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, a bubble tube or a weighted blanket. So a lot of autism uh, groups, uh, parent groups, and also um, like Autism Hampshire, for example, they have a, a lending library. So they have physical objects that they lend out, which you can use in your library if you're able to. 
So um, everyone's different. So for example, uh, one of my sons loves a weighted blanket, but it costs a fortune. My youngest daughter does not. So if I bought one for her, it you know I would it would be a lot of money for me to waste. So you can go and try it out. You can try a weighted vest. You can try out these balls, and you could look at a bubble tube and you know find out. Oh, it's got a humming noise. I don't really like that, but you wouldn't know that if you saw it in mm. a catalogue, for example. So um, if you have a space where you have these things available, you could people could try them out, but also you could lend them out if you're able to. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I'm conscious of it being 11.59. This these two hours have just flown by. It's been amazing. And I just wanted to thank particularly everyone in the chat who's been feeding so much information in that we've just got to capture and harvest. Um, but also really to thank Sorrel and to Ch Chelsea and Logan and Michelle for their amazing contributions. And a big thanks to Sarah who have been working within Dimension. Linda. And I'll just hand over to Sarah to close, if that's OK. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for the chat just keeps coming and coming and I keep saving backups of it so we can take a good look at it when this is finished. Um, any questions that we haven't answered, we will try and put in a QA. and a um, We will try and pull out some of the book recommendations from the chat and any other advice and things that's been popped in there and share with you all. You will soon receive the recording of this session and the presentation slides, um, but the other resources and things might take a little bit longer to develop. So you might not get those for a couple of weeks yet. Um, but yes, thank you, everybody. If you do have any questions, um, you can email us at marketing at dimensions uk.org, pop onto the website, follow us on Twitter, all that usual thing, and we'll put it all in an email to you afterwards. And yes, thank you all. It's been absolutely wonderful. And hopefully um, a lot of you will get in touch and we'll get to speak a bit more directly. Mm. I'm going to leave the webinar live for now just while we save everything. So if all attendees would like to start dropping off now and saying your goodbyes and then me and the team can have a bit of a debrief. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. You're all awesome just for turning up. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah.